the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'd like to ask first, uh, how many of you were here at the opening lecture? Can I see just a whole show of hands? Just about four or five of you? Six? Well, now, these lectures were originally conceived as a series in a uniform theme. So if you feel that what I say this evening is, so to speak, suspended in a medium that you can't get, it will be partly the fault of the fact that you didn't hear the first lecture and partly the fault of the fact that the second lecture wasn't given at all. And now this is the third lecture, and I shall uh, exert myself to uh, mitigate its orphanhood, so to speak, and uh, give it some kind of rear and front support so that it uh, shouldn't be suspended entirely in the ether. I had originally intended to outline very rapidly in three lectures the thesis that there has been a uniformity of Jewish outlook, a uniformity of spirit in the group that we call Jewish, from the first beginnings that we can trace in recorded legend through the time of sophisticated development of moral philosophy, through the time of Jewish national independence, the removal of independence and the displacement of the Jewish people, until about 100 years ago. I would say that a hundred years ago, the Jewish people was still secure. And of course, I use the word secure here in a special sense, not as applying to the external or political security of either an individual or of a people, but to the permanent inner stability which is able to resist the consequences of external disaster. Uh, the kind of security that we theorize about in individuals and really don't know the origin of. I say a hundred years ago, the Jewish personality was secure in that sense. And strangely enough, it was so for the last 2,000 years in the midst of the most precarious conditions. This was due to the extraordinary fact that the Jewish people went on living on borrowed or rented territory as if it were in colonies of its own. You had here the very curious spectacle of a people consisting of colonies without a mother country. The Jews of Babylonia in the first half of the Middle Ages the Jews of Spain in the middle half of the Middle Ages, the Jews of Russia until very recently, Jews of Romania, Galicia, Poland, constituted solid blocks, territorially concentrated, solid blocks of the Jewish people. A people which had gone through quite a number of metamorphoses had changed its language, changed its externals, changed its dress, its cooking, its melodies, and had found in the midst of all these new instrumentalities a mode for the expression of the eternal thesis of the Jewish people. I expounded the nature of this thesis in the first lecture, and I shall be able only to refer to it, as it were, tangentially in the present lecture. 
in which I am going to speak exclusively of the modern time, the modern time meaning the afterglow of that period, that most recent period of stability. That inner Jewish stability began to disappear, I say, about a hundred years ago, and I'm not choosing this just as a convenient round figure, but on very good and sufficient grounds. One of the writers I'm going to discuss this evening is Mendele Mochers Forim. He wrote in his latter years a book which was quite out of his style, quite out of the style for which he has become famous, the bitterly satirical style. He wrote a book of biographical reminiscence under the form of a novel or of somebody else's biography called Schrömer Reb Chaims, in which he described how in his childhood, and he was born in 1835, in his childhood and boyhood, there first appeared among the Jews of Russia the panic of the dissolving personality. And it's quite extraordinary to note that what happened in the spirit of those Jews seemed to indicate something far more calamitous than pogroms, expulsions, and discriminations. There began at that time, in the middle of the 19th century, the penetration of those inner colonies of the Jewish people by the non-Jewish spirit. There came in the technique of modern compulsory education. So is that going to continue all evening over there? But did you speak firmly? <laughs> There came the technique of compulsory education for children in all the European countries, including Russia. Because that was the period of the liberal movement in Russia. The time of the 1840s, 50s, 60s. You remember the freeing of the serfs. At the time of Alexander II, before the assassination of Alexander II. And the Russian government had a sort of a, a clumsy and uh, brutal benevolence toward the Jewish people wanted to stifle its personality, but without uh, pogroms, something like the Bolsheviks today. No anti-Semitism, but the repression of the Jewish personality by a compulsory deflection of attention from Jewish culture and education. And the terror which came over the Jews in that period reflected uh, most specifically, most clearly in this particular book that I'm speaking about, but evident everywhere else, the terror which came over the Jewish people at this threat to its spiritual security is one of the most remarkable phenomena in the history of any people. There was as bitter an outcry against that new technique which they knew the Jewish spirit couldn't survive as there was against pogroms, against robbery, against unjust taxation, against exclusion from civic rights or from commercial privileges. And during that period, 1850, 1860, until about 1905, 1910, there were two responses to this inner threat. There was the response of the Zionist movement, which began with no thought of taking care of individual Je Jewish refugees. The Zionist movement, as it first stirred inarticulately, and, and uh, amorphously in the minds of Jewish masses was not a movement to take care of homeless and displaced Jews. It was a movement for the counteracting of this threat to the Jewish personality. The desire of the Jewish people to return home to a place of its own where it might be secure from these inroads from this irradiation by the foreign body, which it could no longer handle. Until that time, Jews living in these compact colonies, even when they were somewhat interpenetrated by Goyim, 
because they weren't uh, always in a, in a majority, in fact, very frequently, infrequently in a majority, were sufficiently condensed, as it were, to be able to resist. Now they felt that this degree of condensation wasn't enough. They had to have a territory in which the Jewish personality would be safeguarded. The Zionist movement arose. Side by side with it, there also arose a last desperate illusion that this Jewish life, which had maintained its personality across the 18 centuries of the exile, which had remained consistently Jewish and had spun further in different forms the ancient spiritual, cultural, uh, religious identity of the Jew could continue in spite of the fact that the new world was much better armed or was a much more powerful solvent of minorities than it had ever been. And so you have this, ex this extraordinary fact. On the one side, on an almost subconscious level of the Jewish masses, the Zionist movement was crystallizing. A long time ago. The first Zionist classic was, as some of you know, uh, written in 1862 or 1863, Roman Jerusalem by Moses Hess. Now, when a book is written, you may be absolutely certain that it reflects a condition of a time. And uh, it may be extraordinarily um, advanced in its clarification of the idea. But ideas don't come out of nowhere. They are in the air. That's why many inventions come out simultaneously at the same period. Many discoveries come out simultaneously at the same period. So that Zionism was alive in 1860. It must have been alive, as a matter of fact, in 1850, 1840. But it was, as I said, inarticulate and amorphous. So you had the Zionist movement among that mass which was beginning to feel we've got to have a Jewish homeland where these values can be incorporated in a life that is safe from intrusion. And then perhaps by the interplay between that homeland and us in the diaspora, we'll discover a new technique which will enable us to overcome the threat of modern conditions. Now notice, not the threat of pogroms, because as a matter of fact, during the 19th century, the Jews were deeply convinced that they were moving into a period of enlightenment. You remember the 19th century with its great liberalism, with its belief in eternal progress, that uh, superstition was disappearing and the national irritations and hostilities would also disappear and man was moving toward freedom. The great liberal illusion of the 19th century. And Jews shared it. It wasn't against individual displacement then. It was against the fear of the liberal intrusion of the Jewish life. So you had this Zionist movement. On the other hand, as I said, you had the powerful illusion on the part of Yiddish writers and on the part of the same masses in their personality as Yiddish-speaking masses, the powerful illusion that they could still go on living a diaspora life, maintaining these colonies, as it were, of Jews, and continuing into the indefinite future this distinctiveness of the Jewish ethos, uh, cultus, outlook, uh, folklore, habits, and uh, Weltanschauung. And very remarkably, the three great writers who epitomize that period of Jewish literature, namely Sholem Aleichem, Peretz, Mendel Machus Forum, were not Zionists. Actually, uh, Shalom Aleichem was neither Zionist nor anti-Zionist, but he was somewhat of an anti-Zionist. Peretz was for a short time in his early manhood inclined toward the Zionist movement. Thereafter, he was rapidly anti-Zionist. And Mendel just ignores it. Of these three men, I assume that Shalom Aleichem is best known to all of you. Most of you will have heard of Peretz and perhaps seen a few... Uh, uh, works of his, a few short stories, and Mendel Amochus Forum is probably not more than a name. But I've got to deal with all of them because it's by examining them in their diversity and then observing the extraordinary unity of them that you discover how, when Jewish life, Yiddish life, was already tottering to its downfall, it found its highest expression, a common phenomenon, by the way, in history. 
and nations are usually greatest in their fall, when they've ripened to the highest expression, they've probably outlived their political and physical vitality. I say these three men are extremely diverse. Mendele is the oldest of them. He's called the grandfather of Yiddish literature, Der Zede. And uh, he set the style of modern Yiddish writing. He liberated Yiddish from its slavish dependence upon Germanic culture. Until his time, people who wanted to write an elegant Yiddish would do it in a kind of what they called Congress Deutsch. The German that was spoken at the Zionist Congresses with all sorts of elegant uh, willowy, billowy, flowery, bowery phrases worked in from Schiller and from Goethe. And you didn't call a woman a Yidene, you called her a Frauenzimmer. <laughs> and you didn't call a man a Mensch, ein Person, you called him. Mendele was the first to break through into a sort of Chaucerian Yiddish. Direct, uh, fruity, uh, full of uh, pith and uh, full of the folk feeling. As a matter of fact, Yiddish had already taken on a very distinctive, healthy and um, intense character. There had evolved in the Yiddish language a hundred years before that. I'm speaking now of the 1750s and 1760s. There had evolved an immense religious movement, the Hasidic religious movement, which had expressed itself in Yiddish. It was only later on uh, when it became, so to speak, both elegant and corrupt that the Hasidic movement became learned and moved over into Hebrew. Originally, it was a genuine and passionate <coughs> folk expression 150 to 200 years ago. But the first sound written Yiddish without affectation and without borrowing, the first realization, in fact, that Yiddish was an independent structure that it had thrown off completely the spirit of its physical origins, namely the Middle High German, and had become something quite unique in the Western world. The first one to realize this, or to put it into effect in writing, was Mendele. He was what one might call the creator of the Nusach, of the style, the tonality, the nuance of modern Yiddish expression. The modern Yiddish expression that you find only in them, in the early writings of Sholem Ash, in the early writings of I.J. Singer, but now no longer in the writings of the Yiddish writers. The later writings of Singer, of Sholem Ash, of all the familiar figures, has become a kind of international jargon. It is a de-Judaized Yiddish. Not that they borrow heavily from other languages, but the structure, the spirit, is no longer that intimate and peculiar Yiddish which had been evolving for several hundred years and which found its perfect expression in these classic masters, these three classic masters that I speak of. Mendele then was the earliest. He was born in 1835. He began to write early, say around 1855, when he was a youngster and began in Hebrew. It didn't occur to him at first to write in Yiddish. Shortly after him, born I think in 1856 or, 50, or 1859, I think, was uh, Sholem Aleichem. And the third or the second, uh, 1859, 1856, the second was Peretz. And you can take Peretz and Sholem Aleichem as contemporaries. The three men were diverse in their personalities. There was something of the imp or the goblin in Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem was, at least ostensibly or on the surface, an amused and amusing but affectionate spectator of Jewish life. He wasn't a satirist. He was a humorist. And I use the word humor here in its uh, somewhat uh, archaic or even obsolete sense as when they speak of every man in his humor in Ben Jonson's uh, play. The particular type of spirit, the matzav uh, ruach, they call it in Hebrew, the condition of the, of, the, of the spirit. 
he made fun of the Jewish people, but lovingly. And when he bade you laugh at the Jews, he bade you laugh at yourself. He laughed with them as well as at them and invited them to laugh at him. If he made satirical remarks about Jews or remarks which on the surface appear to be satirical, there's something in them which relieves them of the bitterness of satire, such as I shall refer to in Mendela, and makes you feel that there is something here that is a sort of cathartic. You don't place yourself in high moral juxtaposition against the victim of your satire. But always, in this merriment of his, there was a purpose. It wasn't just the human spectacle at large. It was the faults and foibles of the Jews and a constant awareness that there was a need to preach to this people. He was a humorous preacher, as a matter of fact. And if you look into his types, into a type of like his two most famous ones, Tevye der Milchiker, Tevye the Dairyman, and uh, Menachem Mendel, the Luftmensch, you'll discover not merely individuals, you will discover projections of the typicality of the Jewish people. You'll discover in their remarks, in their gestures, in their weaknesses, in their strength, the thesis of the Jewish mind. Now, I'd like to illustrate with a couple of stories the style of Shalom Aleichem and his method of inducing laughter of a type which involved the listener also. You could contrast the story which I'm going to tell you now, which is typically Shalom Aleichem, with a story like The Man Who Corrupted Hadleyburg. You know, they, they used to call Shalom Aleichem the Jewish Mark Twain. And they tell that when Shalom Aleichem came to this country and met Mark Twain, and they introduced Mark Twain to him as the American Shalom Aleichem, he said, Zain Mazla, there is nit, because it was a much more lucrative and uh, honorable position to occupy as the American Mark Twain than to be the Jewish Mark Twain. But there's a difference between Mark Twain too, when Mark Twain went into satire as, I say, in the man that corrupted Hadleyburg, he was the destructive satirist who invites you to an attitude of superiority so that in a Voltairean fashion you may grin from the eminence of your, of your, of your intellect and of your presumably moral superiority at the contortions and the deficiencies of other human beings. But when Shalom Aleichem tells the following story, one is involved in it. He tells the story about himself. How when he was a young rabbi, and he was for a time actually a state rabbi, there came to him uh, some Jews with a dispute, agreeing to accept him as the mediator and paying a fee which was to be given to the Talmud Torah. And uh, he listened to their uh, dispute, gave his verdict, which they didn't like at all. And before they left, one of them said to him, uh, Rebbe, I want to tell you a story. Just before we leave, I want to tell you a story. Well, story, naturally, he said, yes, what is it? So one of them, the leader of this, uh, of this band of cutthroats, uh, told the following story. That uh, some time back, he'd been traveling through the uh, Pale of Settlement, and he found that uh, because of some mix-up in the timetables, on a Friday afternoon, he was in a small town, and there was no train out that wouldn't lead him into the Sabbath. And he got out desolately at this tiny station, didn't know what he was going to do, he wasn't going to ride on the Sabbath, and extraordinary enough, a Jew comes rushing up to him out of nowhere, grabs him by both arms, almost embraces him, and says, God bless you for being here. What is it? What's the matter? He said, I live in this town, there's myself and eight other Jews, my daughter, my, my wife gave birth to a... To a, to a uh, to a boy seven days ago, uh, tomorrow or the day after is the bris, and you'll make the tenth to the minion. You're, you're a blessing. 
It, it's as if God Almighty himself had sent you. So I went along, this man tells, delighted to be of service. And I stayed there over Saturday, and on Sunday, after the bris, I said, well, thank you very much, I'm uh, on my way now, I must go on. And the man said, no, what are you talking about? Never let you go like this. After what you've done for me? Oh, no, you must stay here. Now my wife is on her feet, you're going to taste my wife's blintzes. It's something that, a parallel for which doesn't exist. The man pleaded, I, 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 I can't, I must, but he was insistent. I, he just wouldn't let me leave the house, so I stayed there. And on Monday I said, well, I must really go. Oh, no, no, my wife's borscht. And that was the way he kept me for six or seven days till I was going insane. And at last I tore myself away, and just as I got out of the room, he handed me a bill. <laughs> six days, board and lodging, 45 rubles. So I looked at him and I said, are you mad? He said, did you get board and lodging here? Was the food good? I said, let's go to the rabbi. So I went to the rabbi in the nearest city, and the rabbi looked, looked, and said, man used the technique of salesmanship, and you stayed, you ate, you drank, you rested, you got to pay. So I took out a 50 ruble bill, and I threw it at the man, I said, give me the change. So the man said, are you crazy? You think I want your money? Take your money back, man. Am I going to charge you for being my guest? So I said, well, what's the matter with you? What's the idea? I just wanted to show you what kind of a rabbi we've got. <laughs> whereupon, whereupon Sholem Aleichem then tells, then tells his story. The people who were about to go out, he said, wait a minute, I've got a story to tell you. And he said, you know what happened to a friend of mine just recently? Um... A friend of mine was traveling with quite a large sum of money and found himself in a small town on Erev Yom Kippur and uh, didn't know what to do. He did, was afraid to leave the money in the hotel. He couldn't carry it with him to shul. So he suddenly resolved he'll go to the rabbi the afternoon before Yom Kippur and give it to the rabbi to hold. So he asked where the rabbi lives, went into the rabbi, said, Rabbi, I've got here a sum of money tomorrow Yom Kippur. Will you do me a favor and hold it in your safe? And the rabbi said, certainly, be delighted. Count it out. He said, Rabbi, I don't want to count. He said, count it out. He said, and bring me three of the, my board of trustees, three gaboim. So I said, Rabbi, what's the matter with you? I don't want this kind of thing. He said, bring me three members of the, three, three gaboim. So I brought them three gaboim. And they counted out the money and they put it away and the man went off, davened and fasted. In the evening of uh, Motsu Yom Kippur, he came out, came back to the rabbi. Rabbi, God bless you for your service. I'll take my money and go. The rabbi said, what money? He said, Rabbi, don't you remember? I was here yesterday. <laughs> I, was, I don't remember who you are. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know your face at all. I said, Rabbi, don't you remember I was here with three gaboim? What gaboim? Well, the man went and brought the three gaboim. And the rabbi said, in the presence of the three gaboim, this man says he gave me 200 rubles last night in your presence. Were you here? Did you see anything? No. <laughs> so the man fainted. <laughs> so when he came to, the rabbi went to the safe, took out the money and gave it to him and said, here's your money. She said, Rabbi, why did you torture me like that? What was the idea? He said, I wanted to show you what kind of a board of trustees I've got. <laughs> this was the counter story to the, what, that, that famous phrase stems, the description of the Jewish people, a clean folk, Ober <laughs> a small people, but nasty. And yet all the time, and yet all the time, you feel that Sholem Aleichem's animadversions are not directed in a spirit of uh, moral, personal exhibitionism against somebody else. He's in it. And this power of self-criticism, by the way, is an ancient prophetic streak in the Jews, but this power of self-criticism transmitted, transmuted into humor is typical Shalom Aleichem. There's never or hardly ever laughter in Shalom Aleichem in which there isn't a wry feeling that you're actually laughing at yourself. And also, in laughing at yourself and laughing at the Jewish people, it is a cathartic laughter. It is not aimless. It is not simply malicious. It isn't merely the assertion of your, un of your uniqueness and your state of election. It is an attempt to reform. This was Shalom Aleichem. I could, if I haven't the time, unfortunately, or fortunately, 
Uh, I could go into a lengthy description of these elements in, in the two principal characters that I've discussed as representative figures of the Jewish people. But I've only given you a couple of stories to indicate the, what shall I call it, the, 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 the sound of the strings of Shalom Aleichem's instrument. Peretz was very different. Unlike Shalom Aleichem, he went in first, before he entered imaginative literature, he went in for direct teaching of the Jewish people. This was the period during which the illusion was floating about that one didn't have to change the condition of the Jewish people radically, the illusion I referred to at the beginning of the talk, that one could continue into the indefinite future with a Yiddish civilization embedded safely in a non-Yiddish world and having none of the instruments of government, none of the instruments of control of one's own environment. This belief was very deep and strong in Peretz and Peretz went about the improvement, and I put quotes around it, uh, went about the improvement of the Jewish people systematically and programmatically. On the one hand, there was in Peretz naturally a deep love of the Jewish people or he wouldn't have bothered to do these things. On the other hand, he believed that the Jewish people had to adapt itself to modern life, had to change its economic structure, had to change its attitude toward the cultural values, absorb modern cultural values, absorb them in Yiddish, change the Yiddish language, change the structure of Jewish education. And he spent years, 10, 15 years, himself actually creating the textbooks, himself actually teaching uh, biology and chemistry and physics and uh, uh, sociology and geography. There was something amazing about both of these men, Peretz and Mendele, Shalom Aleichem, went in very little for that sort of formal education. There was something amazing about the courage with which they approached the question of re-educating the Jewish people. Mendele did it first in Hebrew. That was the Haskalah movement. And like Peretz, he went in, he, he gave himself a popular education to begin with. Read enormously, encyclopedically, in all the subjects which it was necessary, uh, in which it was necessary to instruct the Jewish people. And he produced in Hebrew a series of textbooks. I've seen some of them. I've seen some of the Yiddish textbooks of, uh, Mendel, of uh, Peretz. They're rather heroic and rather pitiful too. You see there the autodidact, the self-educated man longing to educate others, but lacking both a fundamental education of the subject and lacking entirely any notion of pedagogy lacking entirely any feeling of rapport between the subject and the people that he wants to teach. It's somebody who's gone insane with enthusiasm and is trying to stuff information down the throats of uh, rather astonished and reluctant people who don't know what it's all about and why one should learn these things and what it means. And then Peretz moved out of this field in part. He never gave up being the public worker and the... Uh, a general educator, he moved out, I said in part, mostly. It was the part that remained with the other. He moved out into his genuine creative field, which was the transmission through a semi-religious fable atmosphere of the total religious value of Hasidism. The Hasidic stories and the folk mices, the folk stories of Peretz, are genuine great literature. His editorials, his textbooks, his appeals to the Jews to educate themselves are just journalism. Very earnest, uh, very sustained, very soporific, and it's a man trying to do his duty under discouraging circumstances. But there was another side to him, the pure artist, whose perception of Jewish values was curiously at variance with his deliberate or programmatic theme, because his deliberate and programmatic theme was modernism. 
science, physics, chemistry, astronomy, history. That was as the formal modernizer of the Jews. And he was just a hack at it. But when he permitted himself to brood on the religious spirit of the Jews and on the infinite ingenuity which the religious Jews had shown in their psychological analyses, he became a great master. The gift of the Jewish religion is its peculiar penetration into human motivation, its capacity to stir somewhere in the interior a responsiveness to the rightness of an act. Peretz showed that in Yiddish, it had been shown before in the Hasidic circles only, he showed it now in literary circles, that in Yiddish you had as powerful an instrument of moral regeneration of perception and of psychological analysis as in any other modern language, and more than in most. His Hasidic stories nearly always consist of an illumination of a particular weakness or defect in a human being. An illumination of the proneness of a man, say, to pride, or to miserliness, or to exhibitionism, uh, or to domination over others, and the extraordinarily subtle way in which these things manifest themselves. The uh, genius which they have for stealing past your guard and just when you think that you've triumphed over a temptation or over a moral deficiency, it's got you by the throat. And in that very sense of triumph over your deficiency, you've given away to it. Now, I can't, for lack of time, go into some of these stories. You'll find some of them in uh, my book, uh, The Prince of the Ghetto. There are some that have appeared in, a transl in translations by, uh, I think it's a professor, uh, one of the professors of City College, the professor of Yiddish there has given a translation of some of Peretz's stories in English. And there's a volume also by the Jewish Publication Society. And the fantastic thing about Peretz was that he never knew that he was a great writer in the folk sense. He always considered himself a, a, um, an important, he wasn't a modest man, an important, a leading public figure, an educator, completely unaware of the uniqueness of his genius purely as the Jew. So that you find in him, as a matter of fact, a very extraordinary dichotomy he longed in many ways to be the European and the cosmopolitan and actually had fulfilled himself when he had retreated most from Europeanization and cosmopolitanism. So you see there's a diversity between him and Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem is the impish one, the uh, loving caricaturist, self-identified with the object of the caricature. Peretz is the public-spirited man, and then on the side, as it, would, as it would seem, but actually, predominantly, the great poet, the sensitive singer of the Hasidic values. And now I come to the person I should have treated first, but who stands out better by contrast with the other two after they've been described, to Mendele. Mendele is the least known of, the, uh, of these writers. And it isn't because he's most difficult to translate or most difficult to treat of. It isn't because he is inferior to them in any respect as a writer. It's because he was a brutal and uh, unrelenting satirist. Seventy, eighty years ago, while the Jewish people was only dimly aware of the spiritual crisis into which it was moving, while the Zionist movement was weak, although perceptible, and the Yiddishism still believed that it could flourish, 
70, 80 years ago, when the satires of Mendele first appeared, no, it's more than that, 1870, that makes it uh, 80 years ago, 85 years ago, when the satires of Mendele first appeared, they were enormously popular. They were, in their uh, scope and in their savagery, something that you'd have to f look for in a uh, Swift or in a Voltaire. But the Jewish people could take it then in that condition. It wasn't aware yet of the extent to which it faced spiritual uh, destruction, and of course it didn't know, it couldn't have dreamt that it faced the frightful uh, physical destruction which was visited on it in the 20th century. Now you just can't read Peretz, uh, uh, Mendele, because it's too brutal. When you think of what happened to those Jews, uh, when you think how they stood up under it, when you think of even if they didn't stand up under it, this utterly pitiless exposure of their weaknesses, this grinning at their small townishness, this contempt for their isolationism, this uh, intolerant rejection of all of their leaders and all, all of their clay Kurdish, all of their public workers, this derisive attitude toward the small Jewish town with its uh, Talmud Torah and its synagogue and its uh, queer political conversations centering, it would appear chiefly, on the recent exploits of Alexander the Great and the recent geographical discoveries of Marco Polo and John Mondeville and Benjamin II, Benjamin of Tudela, these little towns with their stinks and their parmunitzes, these little places with their small spirit, if one, if one looks at them solely through the eyes of Mendele, they become grotesque in their ugliness and in their repulsiveness. The Jews could take it to a very large extent. Seventy, sixty, fifty years ago, even after the pogroms of the 1880s, even after the pogroms of the 1904-05 period in Russia, one could still read Mendele. You can't do it anymore after modern anti-Semitism and Hitler. It's just disproportionate. The fact is that Mendele himself, as he grew old, as he reached into the, I think it was the 60s already, Mendele himself, even in the light of the pogroms of the 1880s, which, as you know, were child's play compared with our modern pogroms, even the Petlura pogrom was child's play as compared with the, the Hitler pogrom, even after the pogroms of the 1880s relented, and wrote in quite another strain in that book of his that I mentioned, namely, Schleimer Reb Chaims. There seems to have been in Peretz, in uh, Mendele, a very savage tenacity of memory. As a youngster, he was very badly treated by some fellow Jews. Uh, swindled, uh, misrepresented, used as a decoy, by professional beggars when he was a youngster, about 14 or 15, and with his uh, uh, widowed sister, traveled through long stretches of the country, being used as a blind and as a common by the man who owned the cart and horse, who collected from people, here's a, a widow and here's a young genius who rattle off pages of the Talmud for you. So that in all of Mendel's writings, there always recurs a horse and a wagon. It's very extraordinary. As a bookseller, you discover that Mendele goes around with a horse and wagon. When, his, when he wrote his most famous satire, namely, The Travels of Benjamin III, a sort of uh, Sancho Panza description of the Jewish villages of the Pale, again, it was horse and wagon travel. Um, Another of his most famous satires, called De Clatcher, the old mare, is again about a horse. He never got away from that early incident. He used the material over and over again. 
He was not inventive in the structure of stories. He was merely inventive in expletive and in savagery, but not in, as an actual storyteller. But as I said, when he grew older and when life in Russia began to darken, of course one didn't foresee what a complete eclipse would come in the 20th century, there welled up in him an old longing, and he reversed himself. I'm going to read to you, for two reasons, some passages, both from Mendela and from uh, Shalom Aleichem, for two reasons. Number one, I want to show you first Mendela in reverse. Not the Mendela of the satires, but the Mendela who suddenly sees the Jewish people in an entirely different light. He's describing an incident out of his childhood, out of the, chi the childhood of Shlomo Reb Chaims, it's his own childhood, in which a number of ignorant Jewish women are going through the ritual of what's called Tzien Licht. Now, Tzien Licht meant drawing threads, wicks, through candles which were poured into a mold wax candles to be used in the synagogue on Yom Kippur or for, um, or for Yarzeitlicht and you drew the thread through the middle of them in the mold. That was called Tzien Licht, drawing candles. Hitherto, in all his satires, Mendel describes Jewish women as fishwives who would soon slap their husbands as talk to them. Uh, women who wore the pants, who were adepts at the... Uh, uh, in, in, among, an, an, among a people of adepts in cursing, in shelting. Thoroughly repulsive slapstick comedy women. And all of a sudden, he recalls and describes these women sitting in the house of one of them, preparing these candles. I'm going to give you a bit of it in Yiddish. Most of it I'll give you in English. I think most of you don't understand Yiddish. So I'll give you a bit of it in Yiddish for those that do, and then I'll give you the uh, English of it. They would do it with a chant that goes like this. And unser Licht und Mannens Licht und Kindes Licht soll nicht ausgelöschen werden für die Zeit Chazve Chalila. These are the words in English. Rebbeinu Shalom, der Barmdiker Gott, may these candles which we make for thy holy name and for the pure souls that have been, may these candles awaken the patriarchs from their graves and may they pray for us that no evil, nor tribulation, nor sorrow shall come upon us. And may our light and the light of our parents and our children not be extinguished before their time. And as I lay this thread for our forefather Abraham, just as you saved him from the fiery furnace, so may you purify us from sin, so that our souls may come before you cleansed of guilt, even as clean as it came into our bodies. And because I lay this thread for the sake of Mother Sarah, so may you, God, remember her son Isaac, when he was led to the sacrifice, and let her plead for us that our little ones shall not be snatched away from us and scattered among strangers like little lost sheep. And as I lay this thread for our father Isaac, may you have mercy on us and grant it to us to bring up our children and be able to pay a rebbe for them so their eyes may shine with the light of the beloved Torah. And for this thread which I lay in the name of Father Jacob, whom you rescued from so many dangers, so many enemies, so may you... He, uh, help us against our enemies and against those that spread evil reports about us. And remember us too for the sake of Solomon, who built the temple, where prayers were said not only by Jews, but by the children of strange and alien peoples, who when they came and prayed there, you listened to their cry. For the sake of Solomon then, let not the gates of heaven be closed to our prayer, and let us be remembered before you, I and my children and my husband and all good people for the new year. Amen. And Mendel, Mendele, the satirist, who all his life had poured out nothing but contempt on Jews, adds this. 
Let him laugh who feels like laughing. Let any man laugh who, hearing these words, is merely amused. More candles, I say. More of these warm, loving words, these hot tears, this love for the Torah and for learning, this love toward all persons and to all mankind. And where were such feelings to be observed? Among plain, simple Yidinists, who, when you looked at them from the outside, seemed to be nothing but coarse and ignorant creatures. May many such women be found everywhere. And now he winds up, go and tell all this to them. To them, means the anti-Semites. May they know what there is in the Jewish heart, and may their mouths be closed. Now, this is certainly the uh, repentance with a vengeance. All his life he had supplied that kind of material, one might say. And uh, when he found out later that uh, it wasn't becoming, it wasn't true, he switched over with the same enthusiasm to complete the adoration of the Jewish people. But the second point I want to make, having uh, shown you how he reversed himself, the second point I want to make is the folkness, or the folksiness of this passage. You see here a people which is at home. Jews were at home among themselves. They felt they were in exile in a political sense, and sometimes almost in a theoretical sense. As a matter of fact, there were many indications among Jews that they had adapted themselves in the course of these hundreds of years to the exile as to their proper mode of existence. You know, they used to call um, Vilna the Yerushalayim de Lita, the Jerusalem of, the Lit of Lithuania. And they said that the origin of the word Poland was the Hebrew phrase Polin. Hebrew meaning, here we will rest. When the Jews first came there, here we will sojourn. And many such indications that the Jews had, in fact, created for themselves this unique mode of existence in the midst of alien and perhaps hostile environments. And this was the adaption which was failing. But it was strong. And there was a very powerful folk life among the Jews, sustained by people who obtained their Jewishness not merely from books, as some of us obtained it, and not merely from the synagogue, but simply from the circumambient air. Life was Jewish about them. And in this Jewishness, there was an element of the primitive, the elemental, which is not to be transferred by sophisticated means, which cannot be transposed into plain into, into uh, merely formal instruction. Let me give you an instance here of a type that Shalom Aleichem describes. He is a Jew thoroughly interpenetrated with Jewishness. The texture of him is Jewish through and through. But he is a moderately ignorant man. He isn't uh, deeply instructed. This is how he talks. It's a balagola, a, 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 uh, the pre-automobile chauffeur. Let the, the, uh, me say the, the, the chauffeur of the non-mechanical age. This is how he talks. Of course, it's in Yiddish. I'll give it to you in English here. A man wouldn't know what to do, I tell you, if God hadn't given us the Sabbath, a gift, a real gift out of his grace. When the Sabbath comes, I'm a different man, do you hear? I get home betimes on Friday afternoon, and the first thing, of course, is the baths, if you know what I mean. There I sit on the top row of the steam room and get myself scalded from head to foot. That puts a new skin on me. Fresh as a newborn babe, I dance home, and there on the table are the two old brass candlesticks, shining like stars, if you know what I mean, and the two big Sabbath loaves, and there right beside them are the winking Sabbath fish sending out a smell that takes you by the throat. And the house is warm and bright and fresh and clean in every corner. So I sit down like a king and open the good book and go twice over the week's portion. Then I close the book and it's off to the synagogue. And what a homecoming after that when I open the door and sing out, Good Shabbos! You can hear me at the other end of town. Then comes the benediction by candlelight, the drop of good old whiskey that sings right through me, if you know what I mean. And then the Sabbath supper, the shining fish and the golden soup and the good old yellow carrots and honey. And that night I sleep like a lord, if you know what I mean. And where am I going in the morning? Why, to the synagogue, of course, as I'm a man and a Jew. 
and back from the synagogue it's the real Sabbath meal again, the grand old chopped radish and the good old onion and the jellied calf's foot, if you know what I mean, with a proper smack of garlic. And when you wake up after your Sabbath nap and your mouth's dry and there's a sourness in your belly, if you know what I mean, what's better, I ask you, than a quart or two of cider? Then when you're good and ready and fresh and strong, you sit down to the good book again like a giant, and off you go, chapter after chapter, eh, psalm after psalm, at the gallop like the mileposts on the road, if you know what I mean. See, so speaks a man of the people. Don't know who he is. It's like somebody walking past a window, saying something and walking on again. But it's of the earth. This is the substance of the Jewish people. We haven't got that anymore. And that's the point of my talk, or one half of, the, uh, one half of my talk this evening, that this folk side of the Jewish people is no more. And that hasn't to do with the Hitlerian destruction. It has to do with the inevitabilities of the development of the modern world in the last hundred years. There are no more self-renewing mass Jewish elements of that kind. There were many of them in the past. There was such a life in Babylonia, there was such a life in Spain, there was such a life in Europe. It is no more. We live lives that are interpenetrated with the surrounding world and our Jewishness simply cannot be of this folk character. If it is to be at all, it has to be on the basis of a deliberate and high and accepted and conscious and sophisticated discipline. Yiddish must die, to my immense regret. I shall do everything that I can to encourage its continuation. If a thing must die, you don't sort of rub your hands and say, well, the quicker the better. <laughs> you try to prolong it. But it's got to die for the simple fact that there are none of these fellows. There isn't this Balagola, and there isn't that Yidina, and there isn't the fish dealer, and there isn't the, uh, the butcher, and there isn't the bodner, and there isn't the tailor. They're not there to, 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 uh, to renew the language. So Yiddish is becoming actually something like a learned language. And the people who um, promote its study at the Evo and excellent work it is that they do are becoming more and more learned. And the uh, bulletins which they issue, highly ingenious uh, uh, grammatical and etymological discussions, which I enjoy enormously, are further and further away from year to year from this people and from this renewal mass out of which alone a language can derive continuation of a cult and a culture and a folklore. I've spoken until now of the diversity of these three men. I want to speak to you of their unity on the basis of the principles or the description which I laid down in my first lecture, which the largest number of you didn't hear. If you take all of these three men from within, if you enter, so to speak, into the Yiddish world and take the Yiddish world for granted and move among these men internally, they are as far apart as poles, if we're going to speak of three poles being apart. But if you view them from the outside and by contrast with the surrounding world, they are only three facets of a single organism or of a single body. Because through and through, whether in satire, whether in... Uh, affectionate uh, folklore, whether in uh, loving uh, uh, derision, in friendly laughter, they examine Jewish life. It is the same Jewish life. It is the Jewish life of a folk which is still under the impress of the ancient continuous attitude toward values. You don't discover anywhere in that Jewish life the Gentile sportive outlook. There is nowhere the acceptance of the competitive theme in human existence as being the basis of existence. Competition there is, of course. Jews can be just as wicked, as mean, as vicious, as cruel, as dominating as anybody else. But there isn't an accepted religious or literary philosophy to cover it and give it glamour. <coughs> in all of Yiddish life of 50, 60, and certainly 100 years ago, there was the same fundamental relationship to the competitive aspect of, human, uh, of the human structure, the same fundamental relationship that you will discover in the Bible, no glorification of sport, no glorification of competition of any kind, but a recognition 
that competition where it occurs is evil. No glossing over of it. No providing of it with glamour and the, the uh, canonization of the great competitors, whether it be in the field or anywhere else. In Yiddish, exactly the same attitude. And I say this with uh, particular emphasis because it represents a revulsion of feeling on my own part. Many, many years ago, much longer ago than I care to reflect on when I was a youngster, I believed that the Yiddish um, evasion, because it seemed like an evasion, of the understanding of sport was merely the consequence of the Jewish deprivation of the opportunities. I believed that if Jews didn't understand uh, cricket and didn't understand the baseball and looked uh, with uh, alarmed and uh, uncomprehending eyes on, on football and on horse racing and all that kind of thing, it was only the consequence of the fact that they had lived these restricted lives in their ghettos. Their lives hadn't been spacious, both in the physical and in the figurative sense. There was no room. They had never known the tournaments of Ashby de la Zouche, and they had never known any of the uh, uh, circumstances in which you have quarter staff fencing and fighting and, and, and wrestling and the applause of uh, great crowds and all the gaiety and the uplift and the tumult and the mass enthusiasms of these things. How could they have had it? I believed that that was the explanation. And it was only when I began to see the continuity of this spirit from the Bible in the time when the Jews were independent, could live any kind of life they liked, from the time when the Jews living in the midst of the competitive and sportive peoples in the time of the Hellenistic Greeks and the Seleucid Greeks of Asia Minor, right through the Middle Ages, until the modern time, until a hundred years ago, they have kept this uniformity of outlook. Nowhere in any of these classic Jewish writers is there a hint of an understanding of that peculiar lust of enjoyment which there is in the physical competition. And whereas the literature of all the nations glows with this experience, with the uprush of the blood and the thud of the pulses and the, the glitter of the, of the event, all literature is uh, interpenetrated with it, there isn't even a hint of an understanding of what it's about among the Jews. They don't even describe it as a Mongolian. They can't describe it. It is completely alien to their outlook. And this astounding consistency, which marks the Jewish personality in its literature, of whatever kind, poetical, prose, epic, to whatever extent they have the epic, uh, the religious, the philosophic, the discursive. This uniformity runs from the beginning of, let us say, 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, down until 100 years ago. You begin to get the beginnings of an attempt to Yiddishize the Goyish world within the last 100 years, still not successfully. You cannot, in Yiddish, write an article by Red Smith, the famous uh, uh, sports commentator. You couldn't, in Yiddish, give a broadcast of a football game with those uh, uh, tense pauses and gasps and excitements which are part of the, uh, of the technique and the hokum of that sort of broadcast. It just couldn't be done in Yiddish without making the language entirely alien to itself. For that matter, you can't do it in Hebrew. There is an attempt to do it. Maybe the attempt will succeed. Maybe Yiddish will cease to be Yiddish and Hebrew will cease to be Hebrew. And maybe the Jewish people will disappear as a Jewish people. It will retain the name. It will move over into that new personality. And this particular experiment in the history of the planet will be liquidated. And maybe not. It isn't my purpose to evaluate here this evening or in this series of lectures the probabilities in this respect. But that these possibilities exist and that these are the forces which are at play about the Jewish people is what I would like to make clear. And they can be made very clear indeed to one if one takes 
All this material that I've speaking of, spoken of in greater detail, all the material of the Jewish expression from the beginning and observes its strong and essential peculiarity. It's standing away in a marked standoffishness from the rest of the world, pursuing a line of its own, never mind whether successfully or not, whether ethically, morally more triumphant than the other, but certainly a definite and irreplaceable expression of the spirit. Now, these are the elements which enable us to understand or to discover at least some sort of intelligible pattern in the long trajectory of Jewish existence throughout the last 3,500 years. I've given them to you in the very barest and briefest outline only in the hope that it will give you some sort of encouragement and some guidance in a more detailed and protracted study. And I'm now prepared to take questions. Yes. Don't we have some pretty uh, strong messages of the uh, uh, this, uh, continuation of the Jewish spirit right in New York City, in places like Borough Park and Williamsburg? Uh, I know people who have that very same spirit. Yes, we still have these uh, ice flows holding together in the midst of these summer seas. But you can see them actually wasting at the edges, can't you? You see those groups diminishing uh, and becoming more and more in the nature of curiosities. I'm speaking now historically. I don't mean that from one year to another you can actually observe there's actually a perceptible shrinkage but certainly from decade to decade there is. You're quite right, there are strong groups, comparatively strong groups, but they don't compare at all with the groups that used to be. In fact, they are already aware of a certain defiance which they represent to the rest of the world. Let the rest of the world perish, we are like this. It wasn't so among the Jews. They felt that the rest of the world was all wrong. They felt that the rest of the world was abnormal and that they were the normal. But even among these Jews, you discover a certain feeling of fear of the abnormal and the curious. To those original Jews, it was the Goy who was abnormal, not we. And with a certain amount of reason, because how could a human being be normal who didn't fast on Yom Kippur, didn't eat matzahs on Pesach, and didn't go to shul on Shabbos? Is that a normal human being? <laughs> but we don't feel that way. Yes? You spoke of the lack of the competitive spirit in uh, most of Jewish writing, the authentically Jewish writing. Uh, how would you uh, consider then a poet like Chaim Nachman Biot, who very often has the sense of conflict in some of his work? Something like, Which, for uh, instance? Well, the Gei Hahar Aga, or uh, the one that's of the wilderness. Be, be, yeah. Well, he has described in, in the dead of the wilderness, here Hariga, and in, uh, in the Mete Midbar, uh, he describes conflict, he uh, describes it, but in my opinion, he doesn't describe it like a man who actually relishes and uh, relishes the clash and the tumult and lifts you up in Homeric style into the battle itself. You know, they asked Bialik once, how did he come to write a poem like The Dead of the Wilderness in which there are gigantic and overwhelming description of the great reaches of the desert with the snake gliding with its glittering scales, with the, the, the hieroglyphs of its scales, it describes it shining in splendor in the sun, and the jackals coming out of that. How did he describe it? He said it was very simple. I lay down in the backyard of my grandfather's house and I looked at a little patch of sand and I described the whole desert from it. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, you see it, it's an intellectual effort, that description in the, in the Dead of the Wilderness. Similarly, his you, you dis compare the description of the Dead of the Wilderness, those heroes rising to battle and rushing up into the hills to fight with God. You, dis you compare that with a description of a, a fight between, uh, let us say, Aeneas and Turnus in the Aeneid, or Diomed, among the in, in the in the in the Odyssey, and you'll see the difference between uh, 
between the genuine Goy who writes and, and his Neshoma is in it and he's slavering to get into it and, uh, and after the Goy is by him in the hand. You'll see the difference between that and the way a Jew describes it. Very fine, very fine, but highly intellectual. There isn't the genuine lust of battle in any of those descriptions. A Jew didn't feel lust of battle. If he had to fight somebody, he fought. How about, how about Polish words? It's the same thing. You will not, you see, one of the reasons why these things don't translate and don't carry in the Goyish world is because the descriptions are not native and authentic. You will find, a, a particularly, Apatashu is a modern. He's got, he's, he's read in the other peoples. He'll try to reproduce it. Uh, you'll find it in Bialik. But this is not the essence of Jewish literature. It is not where the Jewish literature establishes itself and retains its character and continues its particular identity. Yes? Why did those three authors you mentioned are not Zionists? Because they were caught up in the motivated illusion of wanting that particular world that they were born into to continue. They wanted to believe that Yiddish could continue, that Jewish life could be established on the basis of political minority rights. You remember, perhaps, you've read about the struggle around political minority rights at the time of the Versailles Treaty and how there was a tremendous to-do about the Jews being able to teach in their own language and being able to administer their own cultural institutions and their own hospitals. It was all wind <coughs> because life was passing that by. Minorities cannot continue to exist in that form. They had the illusion that it could. Simon Dubnov, the great expositor of the idea of Gaulist nationalism, down to his last days, quite recent, I think, in, within 10 years, continued to believe in Gaulist nationalism. There are still Jews who believe in it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion. It's a fixation from which they can't rid themselves. And those writers were among them. Didn't they feel any identification with uh, Palestine at all? Yes, they did. Shalom Aleichem felt it. In that Gaulish nationalism, there wasn't necessarily a rejection of Palestine, but it didn't make it the center of the mode of Jewish survival as the Zionists did. It was part of the tradition for them. You may remember Mendel, uh, uh, um, uh, Tevye, the, 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 the dairyman at the end, he's going to uh, transfer himself to Palestine, he's going to, in his old age, he's going to die in Palestine. Uh, but uh, that's peripheral in the uh, Gaulish nationalist output, it's not central. Yes? Uh, I believe that an average young Jewish parent uh, would not want his child to be a Yiddish-speaking baladula, but rather an English-speaking doctor. Now, the, the problem is this. How can we, who come descended from a folk who don't believe in a competitive uh, society, live in America, where if you believe that, you'd be called up before the Un-American Committee as a communist? How can we reconcile? Uh, reconcile our living in a communal way in an economic situation which demands uh, competition, free enterprise, etc. How can we remain Jewish and yet live in an American society then? Well, it's the old problem of social man in an unsocial world. How can a human being remain good in a bad world? That's really what the problem is, isn't it? Yeah. Although I would rather object to your way of putting it that you'd be accused of communism if you were accused of communism by the un-American, by the, uh, I need to pull you right, the un-American committee, the um, Committee on Un-American Activities, uh, it would be, I say, on false grounds because the, the, the communists are just as competitive as anybody That's else. True, but many, people many think that the communism is like that. Anyhow, there is the difficulty of being a good person in a bad world. That's all that you're really asking. And uh, one yields as much as one must. One does what one can. At least one must recognize that competition is bad. If in the inherited structures of the social organism and in the long, slow, uphill amendment of this organism, we look toward a cooperative society, the fundamental is to know that competition is not a native and original good. It is the remnant of a negative phase in human and animal existence. The degree to which one can uh, retain one's uh, morality is an individual matter.
It's an immense problem for which I certainly haven't got an answer. Yes? Uh, in light of this uh, whole problem of competition being a very un-Jewish kind of thing, I'm wondering uh, if you have any comments to make about the fact that Israel uh, created a Maccabee, which is a sports competition. Yes, the creation of the Maccabee by, the, uh, by, the is by Israel and a great many other phenomena that they're pushing hard, they're pushing like mad sports sections in their newspapers. It's all fake to me. It's all, it's all, it's all uh, nonsense. It's, uh, it's, um, I find it personally repulsive. Not that uh, I object to uh, athletics. I think they're, 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 they're good, they're necessary. The Jews never objected to athletics. The Jewish father was always bidden to teach his son the use of arms and riding and swimming riding, swimming and shooting, but this uh, monkey business of uh, vast crowds and excitements and this is the real expression of the uh, democracy of a people, the exaltation of this thing into a matter of international, um, international policy, uh, the belief that this is the way that uh, peoples uh, come to understand each other, whereas everybody knows that the Olympiads were the centers of the dirtiest and filthiest intrigues and the deepest rancors and the most poisonous hatreds and the lowest types of humanity to be found on this side of the, of the River Rhine. <coughs> now, the very fact that every one of them found it in his heart to go to Bechtesgaden, no, 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 to Garmisch Partenkirchen was where the famous Olympiads were held in 1936, and by the way, have you ever discovered uh, very democratic spirits among boxing promoters and uh, owners of baseball clubs and uh, uh, athletes generally? It's a world which uh, disguises under perhaps the most uh, lying um, tradition, disguises the innate viciousness of human beings, the desire to triumph over each other. The competition which occurs in life is bad enough. If at least you regret it and say, I wish I could change it, and make an attempt to change it. But to glorify it, which is what they do, is the cardinal sin, because then there's no attempt to change it or to, to modify it. Then it is a, there is a desire to perpetuate and even to enhance it. And I don't pretend the Jews haven't competed. They have. And the Jews haven't been wicked. They have. The point is that if you don't recognize the source, you can never make a beginning at, uh, at amending the situation. Yes? Uh, will the enormous influx of Oriental Jews into Israel change that pattern more in line with this ancient cultural uh, mind? I don't know. Because I really don't know much about what Arab life is like and what the Jews have imbibed in the Arab world. There's a, a good deal of the competitive there, too. It's interesting. It didn't take the form of the arena of the palestrum. Uh, that it took among the Greeks and the Romans, and also among the Arabs la uh, later on, took the form of hunting. It's a curious fact that uh, in the Orient, kings are great huntsmen. There isn't a single Jewish king who's a, who's a hunter. What the competitive spirit uses as its instrument there, I don't know, and what the effect of these will be in Palestine, I don't know, in Israel. Um, I don't believe that it will have an effect in that direction. I mean, a curative uh, effect in that direction. But um, it's something on which I can't give you any sort of information. It's outside my field. Yes? Uh, the relation you are thesis about competition and, and this question that you considered it, uh, isn't it your, your position that the Jewish opposition or the Jewish um, feeling in relation to competition is not is not the uh, opposition to competition as a matter of necessity, but rather uh, different from the uh, non-Jewish worlds uh, tend to glorify competition for the sake of glory, not for the sake of necessity. Uh, I, I had a feeling this question about the, the, uh, living in this, in this uh, form of uh, society in which we live so it changes the position I thought you originally placed it. Let me see now. You, you recognize that Jews uh, see competition as a regrettable necessity or rather a regrettable inevitability 
rather than as a primary virtue. You do see that, yes. the Jews so regarded. You think this is going to be changed no, in the no. new situation? I just wonder whether your point, as you, as you expressed in, in your own book, the Japanese Jew, uh, is uh, not in the Gentile world, Composition is glorified yes. for the sake of glory. It is glorified as being the foundation of life. That life cannot be without competition, which means that life is death. Life is an eternal struggle and uh, it's a fantastic. The more you live, the more you kill. The more you live, the more, the more, the more you die. That, that, is, that is, in effect, the paradox of it. Uh, whereas the Jewish, uh, the biblical and the general Jewish point of view is that this is a survival and uh, a permanent adoption of this outlook means a negation of existence, which was very distinctly the prophetic, uh, the prophetic attitude. Yes? Since we brought up the subject of the book, The Gentleman and the Jew, it has been in a number of circles a question of the subject of very hot discussion. And your uh, position on competition in Jewish life it may not be that your original position that the Jews themselves were not uh, subject to these experiences uh, does have some more validity than you gave it in that book. Have in mind the fact that at the different, among the different students at schools among Jews, there was always a tremendous competition among one another. Uh, the favorite student of the Rebbe became the Rabbi in the, uh, himself, who acquired Smith. He was, uh, as you once put it in one of your other lectures, now look, let me, let me interrupt you because I, I, you're, you're going off in, in, in a familiar wrong direction. I want you to make a distinction between the necessity of competition which exists for a limited number of advantages and the competition which is instituted for its own sake. Now, if people say are competing for the attention of a rabbi, for a university degree, for a particular job. This is an inevitability, at least a relative inevitability within the structure of a given situation. But that you should go outside of it and you should create unnecessary and uncalled for competitive situations and exploit these competitive situations not merely for the competition for the object, but in order to pull in the loyalties and the passions of tens of thousands of spectators, that's a totally different story. I'm not talking of competition per se, either in the book, nor have I tried to speak of it thus this evening. I've talked of the glorific glorification of competition as a concept and representation of life. Of course Jews compete. You must compete in the world. The question is whether that competition is organic in a situation, or whether it's something gratuitous, confirming competition as such. In one of your books, you speak of uh, the... Uh, Don't mind the particular illustration. What are you trying to discover? What, what bothers you? You overstated your case. That I overstated my case? Mm -hmm. Well, then, you must accept the statement as I've made it here and now. I can't discuss my book here because I'm, I, 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 I am quite certain to my sh immense chagrin that not more than a, a tenth of the people here have read it. But uh, I can't discuss the book here. You can only discuss relevantly what I've said this evening, and what I've said this evening I stand by. Are there other questions? Well, it's a quarter past ten, and I think we'll call it an evening. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.